Indeed, Lord, we declare that you are holy, holy, holy indeed. We lift up your name here amongst us and we say to you, O Lord, you are Lord of Lords, you are King of Kings. Be Lord over our hearts. Be King over our families. Be Lord over our church. Be King over our land. Come, Lord, be enthroned in our midst, we pray. Our hearts are open to you and we lift up your name. And in so doing, we know you will draw all men unto yourself. You will draw us into your very presence. So that, Lord, once again, we may hear from you and your word, your word that is true, your word that is alive. And so, Lord, come. Come amongst us even as we enthrone you. Come amongst us even as we declare that you are Lord. Come amongst us and be our King today. For you are holy. You are holy. You are holy, Lord. Have your way in us, we pray. Thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, may all God's people say, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Can you turn to one another before us today and say, we are here in the presence of the Lord. Amen, Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Please be seated. Thank you, Chris and the worship team for leading us in a time of worship. It's wonderful that we can gather in praise of the Lord who is King and who is Lord in our midst. Well, in the last month, we have preached through the sermon series on Serve One Another, and that's because that's the theme for our year. The theme for the church year is Serve One Another. And we have completed that sermon series, and we're now starting another sermon series on 1 Timothy, the epistle of 1 Timothy from the Apostle Paul to Timothy himself. And the epistle of 1 Timothy carries on in the same vein of serving one another because here is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, a servant of the church, in how he can serve the church with the attitudes that he, can, he must adopt and the actions that he can take. And so this is the Apostle Paul telling Timothy how he can serve the church. And so over the next six weeks, we'll be looking at a servant's charge, a servant's prayers, a servant's qualities, a servant's trials, a servant's wisdom, and a servant's riches. Today, we're looking at a servant's charge. And as we look at a servant's charge from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, who is this Timothy? Many of us would know him because it's a letter that's written from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. But who is he really? I mean, we read from Acts chapter 16 that Timothy is a son of a Jewish woman who is a believer. And so here are two things of his mother. First, she's a Jewish believer, which means she's a Jew. But she's also a believer, means she believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here is Timothy, the son of a woman who is both a Jew and a believer of Jesus Christ. But his father was a Greek. And so his father is not a believer, right? His father is not a believer. Now, Paul had met Timothy on one of his missionary journeys, and Paul then wanted Timothy to accompany him on the rest of his journey. And we read that Timothy did do so. Timothy did go with the Apostle Paul to his missionary journeys. And we read of how uh, the Apostle Paul would write in his own letters to the churches of how his Paul, together with him, is Timothy, and so forth and so on. In many letters, Paul writes of how Timothy is with him. And so we know that, the, that Timothy did accompany the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. And on his missionary journeys, the Apostle Paul discipled Timothy. The Apostle Paul became a discipler of Timothy. And that is why in the verses that we will read, you will hear that the Apostle Paul calls Timothy his true son, his true child, because he had been the discipler of Timothy. Timothy. And so we read from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. So 20 verses, a bit long, but hang in there, we'll read from verse 1 to 20. Here it is. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. A pretty standard opening of the Apostle Paul's letters. 
Verse 3, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. So Timothy is now at Ephesus, remain there at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away in vain discussion, into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is, that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Notice the play of word here. Law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godly and sinners, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted, I thank him, this is Jesus Christ, who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus." The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost or greatest. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hermeneus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are a number of children in our service here, and I'm sure, therefore, they will understand this, because this happens in a classroom. Imagine a class teacher telling the class monitor. So, children, do you all know what class monitors are? Yes. Yes. Why ain't the children, the child, knows what a class monitor is? You all know what class monitor does, right? They are to help to enforce discipline in the class. Is that true, children? No? The class monitors don't help you to enforce class discipline? Uh, I suspect the teachers would hope that the class monitors can help to discipline the class, right? Especially if the class teachers are away. And so imagine with me, this class teacher, telling the class monitor, class monitor, I'm about to go away. And when I go away, there will be some boys among you who will want to jump on the tables because I hear them saying that they are going to do so already. And so, can, class monitor, I tell you, when I go away, tell them, don't jump on the class tables, okay? And now, true enough, the class teacher goes away from the class and then the boys begin talking to themselves, the class teacher is away. Let's jump on the class table now. And they begin to want to do so. And then the class monitor doesn't know what to do. Now the class teacher hears of it, that these are the boys who are going to jump on the class table soon. And so the class teacher who is away begins to text a WhatsApp message to the class monitor. Tell them not to touch, not to climb onto the tables and not to jump on the tables. And that's what the class teacher tells the class monitor to do. Something like that is happening in the epistle from Apostle Paul to Timothy now. The Apostle Paul had gone away, but before he went away, he knew 
that there were some people in the church who were going to stir up problems, who was going to stir up troubles, who was going to teach a different doctrine. And so he had told Timothy to stay there in Ephesus so that Timothy can tell them not to do so. But now that the Apostle Paul is away, true enough, these people began to rise up and they began to teach a different doctrine, began to jump on the tables, as it were. And so the Apostle Paul now writes not a WhatsApp message because last time we got no WhatsApp, but writes a letter to Timothy to tell him what to do. And that is why, and that's what we read from Acts chapter 20, verse 29 to 30. Here is the Apostle Paul telling the Ephesus leaders this before he left the church. He tells them, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves would come in among you, not sparing the flock from among your own selves. There will be people in the church, in the classroom, in the church. They will come up and will arise these men who will speak of twisted things and who will draw away the disciples after them. And that is why in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy this, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, as I left the church, I urge you, remain in Ephesus, where you are right now, remain there, so that you may charge. Charge who? Charge these certain persons not to teach this different doctrine, not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promotes speculations. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy to charge him to remain faithful to the faith and to charge these certain persons who are leading the church astray. And this word charge happens again and again in the letter. In 1 Timothy, the letter itself it happens at least four times here in 1 Timothy 1.3, that you may charge certain persons not to teach any other doctrine. In 1 Timothy 1.5, the aim of our charge is love. 1.8, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy. 5.21, just before the end of the epistle, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of all the elect angels, I charge you. So this Apostle Paul is charging Timothy to remain faithful to the faith and to tell others to remain faithful to the faith, to charge him, to commission him, to tell him to teach others not to be distracted by all these different doctrines, but to remain faithful to the faith. And this charge that the Apostle Paul is giving to Timothy is the charge to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to be distracted by all these different doctrines that are happening, that are rising up from people, but to hold on to the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ, to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do we know this? It will unfold in the epistle. In the first few verses, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy of this different doctrine. There's a reason within the church, something that he has already foresaw. And this different doctrine is about myths and endless genealogies, about speculations. What speculations are these? What myths are these? Well, scholars don't have a concrete idea of what the Apostle Paul may be talking about. It could be that some people within the church have been looking at the Old Testament and trying to find out uh, legends or myths from the Old Testament about how they can now, from these myths and legends, uh, how they can now live their lives in the current times. It could be that uh, some people were looking at all the history of the genealogy from the ancestors and tracing different people groups uh, out of these ancestors. And you know, in the Old Testament, right, the patriarchs would place their hands on these uh, individual uh, sons and then has, uh, uh, prophesy over them. And perhaps, you know, some people were saying, oh, because this group of people came from this son and therefore uh, they must be like that and like this. And so perhaps that could be so for the endless genealogies or speculations, speculations about what the Old Testament uh, festivals are like and how that, imply, that is uh, 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 making an impact on their lives right now. But regardless of what all these myths, endless genealogies and speculations are, they are distracting the church from the stewardship from God. As we read here in, the last, in, in verse 4, they were distracting the people of God from being able to hold on to this stewardship that has been given to them from God, that is by faith. 
They were digging into things that were not helpful. They were looking into myths and genealogies that were distracting them from the gospel of Christ. They were distracted from the stewardship from God. And in so doing, they have wandered away. They have wandered away into vain discussion. Instead of being able to hold on to what is most important, the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have now wandered away into vain discussion. Desiring to be teachers of the law because now, right, they were digging deeper and deeper in the Old Testament. They think that now they can teach the Old Testament because they know of the myths, they know of the genealogies, they know of speculations from the Old Testament and now they want to teach it to others. They want to be teachers of the law. They have wandered away into vain discussion and now they want to teach that very same thing. They want to teach people of these other different doctrines that will then distract people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why Ben Witherington, a Methodist scholar, wrote in his commentary on 1 Timothy these words about this myths, genial, endless genealogies and speculations. He writes these words, What the false teaching produces is arguments, speculations, and wrangling. Right? There were different people uh, uh, talking about different myths, different people speculating about different things, and so it led to arguments, speculations, and wrangling. In short, Ben Ritterman says, trouble and division. It was threatening to divide the church from what is truly true, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were finding themselves in different factions because of different things and different speculations they were believing in. And the Apostle Paul calls this vain discussions. Vain meaning empty, meaning fruitless, meaning purposeless, meaning meaningless. There is no meaning in these discussions. It distracts them. It's nothing that contributes to the gospel of Christ, to the extension of God's kingdom. It is vain discussions. Are there things like this happening in our time? Are there vain discussions in our time as well? And I believe there might be a few. Uh, even more prevalent now because of social media, right? It's no longer contained only in one church where people can gather physically. Now everybody can assess to discussions, to myths and speculations that happen on social media. And some of this might be Old Testament numerology, for example. People who discuss about what uh, certain words, uh, certain names in the Old Testament mean by calculating the number of the alphabets in Hebrew and joining them together and uh, coming up with all kinds of uh, possibilities of what the name or the places or the events mean, right? And it leads to different discussions. Uh, it leads people to be distracted from what is truly important, and that is the gospel of Christ. Uh, discussions about end times. When will the end times come? Are these end times right now? Are these end times then? Uh, this, this thing is happening in Israel right now. This thing is happening in, uh, in, in Iraq right now. Does this mean it's end times? Uh, there's a new uh, leader in the EU. What does it mean? And people are speculating whether this means the end times have come. And different people have different views, leads to divisions in the church, and distracts people from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another one could be Jewish festivals, looking at Jewish fest festivals and what they mean, and what does it mean then for world events that are happening right now, especially in the past few months, you know, with the Israel and Gaza war happening, people looking into, oh, why did it, ha why did it happen at a point in time, what Jewish festivals were happening at a point in time, and therefore what does it mean for world events that will happen, and all oh, speculations and myths that distract people from the gospel of Christ. All these discussions distract people from what is truly true and what is most important, and that is holding on to the truth of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ and using it to extend God's kingdom. The gospel of Christ, which saves, is now being distracted and being put aside because of all these myths and speculations. And that's what's happening in the Ephesus church. People were looking into the Old Testament, into the law, and coming out of all kinds of myths, speculations, and endless genealogies. And so the Apostle Paul then goes on to write, but there is a proper use of the law. And what is this proper use of the law? The people were using the Old Testament, using the law wrongly, and now there's a 
proper use of the law. And the Apostle Paul says this in verse 8. Now we know that the law is good. It is good. It is not a bad thing. If one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless, for the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners. And he goes on to write all the other examples, right, of, who, of what sinners, uh, how sinners look like. And so the Apostle Paul was telling Timothy that the proper use of the law is to show that we are all sinners. It is not to help us to come up with all kinds of myths and endless genealogies and, and speculations, but it's to help us to know that we are sinners. We are sinners and we are in need of the gospel of Christ. We are in need of Jesus Christ. And that is why the Apostle Paul goes on in chapter 1 to write about how he himself is a sinner about how he himself received Christ's grace for his life. He writes, I thank Jesus, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though, formerly, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. We know why the Apostle Paul writes of these things, right? Because before he became the apostle, before he became, he knew of Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour, the apostle Paul was a Pharisee, persecuting the church. In fact, he was there when Stephen was stoned. He was persecuting the people who were believers of Christ. He had been their insolent opponent. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of the church. And that's why the apostle Paul says, I am the great sinner, but I received mercy. Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And so the Apostle Paul was saying this, that the proper use of the law is to show us that we, were, we are sinners. And when Christ comes to encounter us with His grace, we can then receive it fully, knowing that being sinners and yet Christ loves us and now pours forth His grace upon us to help us to know His, faith, to know His love for us. The grace of our Lord overflowed into the Apostle Paul. And that is the proper use of the Old Testament, not for myths and endless genealogies and speculations, but to show us that we are sinners in need of Christ's grace. And now he himself has received it and he's telling Timothy, do this, help others to know that they are sinners too. From the Old Testament, not the myths and the speculations, but help us, help them to know that they are sinners so that they may receive grace for their lives. Don't let them be distracted by all these different doctrines. And that is why the Apostle Paul goes on to say, this is the truth. What is the truth? The truth is this. The saying is trustworthy. This is one of the five trustworthy sayings in 1 Timothy. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That, and this is the gospel, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Old Testament shows that we are sinners and Christ Jesus has come now to save us, we who are sinners. And that's what we remember when we celebrate Holy Communion today, that Christ came to die on the cross so that we who are sinners might be saved. Every single month when we come for Holy Communion, we reenact the gospel of Jesus Christ, reminding one another what Christ did for us, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. That is why the Apostle Paul also goes on to say, me who is the greatest sinner, now Christ has done so for my life to display his great patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. What the Apostle Paul is saying is this, that even I who persecuted the church, who was a blasphemer, even I who was, uh, who, who was there you know, to, as an opponent to the church, even I could receive grace from Christ, let alone anyone else. Everyone can receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, His love. And that is why the gospel is so important for all of us. Let us not be distracted by myths and speculations, but remain steadfast to the gospel of Christ that saves, that saves 
every single one, even the greatest sinner. And that is why this is the charge to Timothy and to us as a church, the charge to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us not be distracted by anything else. The Apostle Paul doesn't say that all these myths and speculations, they are sinful things. No, but they are unhelpful things. They are things that distract us from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why he goes on to write to Timothy, continue to do so, that by them you may wage the good warfare or fight the good fight in some versions, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Fight the good fight against all these different doctrines. Speak against them so that the truth of the true, the, the, the most important thing prevails, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hold on to faith. Don't be distracted by all these different things. Hold on to faith and practice what you teach. Be of good conscience. Live the way you talk. Walk the way you talk so that you might have a good conscience and by this, you may help others to also hold fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's something that I heard, the words, some words that I heard from yesterday, I attended an ordination service, and uh, words that are similar to what the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy uh, struck me yesterday when it was said. And the person who said this uh, used these words, believe in what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. Believe what you read of the Gospels, that Christ came to die for us. Teach what you believe. Pass on this Gospel of Jesus Christ that is so important. And as you do so, practice what you teach. Live your life with a good conscience, believing in what you teach and practicing what you teach. But, the Apostle Paul says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Notice what the Apostle Paul is doing. For those who continue to speculate, continue to uh, believe in these memes, continue to distract uh, the church from the gospel of Christ, he hands them over to Satan, meaning he leaves them alone, he no longer uh, wants to reach out to them, so that it is not punitive, but it's redemptive so that they may learn. They may learn not to blaspheme. And prayerfully, hopefully, they will then come back to the gospel of Jesus Christ and no longer blaspheme with all these memes and all these speculations. What the Apostle Paul does is not punitive, but redemptive. And that's how we can serve one another as well. We serve one another by helping each other to hold on to this charge that the Apostle Paul gives to Timothy to help one another to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if by and by some of us are distracted by myths and speculations that do come up once and again in our world, we have to encourage one another not to be distracted, but to hold on fast to Jesus Christ. But if they continue to do so, then to protect the rest of the sheep, perhaps they have got to be let go so that over time, prayerfully, they may learn not to to blaspheme. And so what is our charge? Our charge is to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just as the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy holds on to this charge, teaches it to the church. We too, the church now, inherits this charge and we are told to hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us not be distracted by myths and speculations in the world but hold on to the gospel of Christ and to let others know of this gospel, the gospel that saves even the greatest sinner. And that's what some of us in our church has been doing week after week. There is a small group of us in our church, a few individuals who have joined with others from other churches, and every week they go out into the Topayo community. Every week, they go out into the Topayo community and they meet people and they share the gospel of Christ with them. They tell them of how we are all in need of Christ. They share with them the gospel of Christ, how Christ came, 
died on the cross, rose again so they might have life, life eternal, and challenges them to accept this grace, this love of Christ for their lives. And a number have come to know Christ for their own selves, for their lives, and have come into the kingdom of God. They are not distracted by the many things that are happening in this world about myths and speculations, but have held on true to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and have extended that to others so that others may know of this love, of this grace of Christ, this gospel of Christ for their own lives as well. And that's what we're called to do as a church. We serve one another by helping one another to hold fast to this gospel of Christ, but we also go forth so that others may know of this gospel as well. And this is the charge that we are called to cherish in our hearts and to work it out with our lives. Amen? Let us pray together. Father, we want to thank you for the example of faith of Timothy. We want to thank you for the Apostle Paul for his instructions for Timothy and the church that we now inherit for ourselves as well. A call for us to hold fast to the gospel of Christ and not to be distracted by the many means and speculations that can arise in this world. Help us, Lord, to be able to serve one another, to help each other to not be distracted, but to be able to hold fast to the gospel. Help us to encourage one another too to go forth so that others may know of this gospel. And in so doing, we pray that the gospel of Christ will truly be extended here on this earth and more and more people will know the love and grace of Christ himself. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.